feel like is your, uh, your, your right to do so. I want you to vote, but a vote uh, for sure on Tuesday. It'll be a great time to, to do what you can to help all you can. So get out and vote. All right, what else? All right. Special prayer needs, uh, we're just talking about uh, James Latham. So James and Elaine, keep them in your prayers in a special way. Things are not, not well for James. So uh, keep, your, keep your prayers going for James and Elaine as they're going through this, this time. We also want to pray for the Pate family that their uh, that funeral's today where they'll be burying both mom and, well, not mom and dad, they didn't have any children, but, but both husband and wife today. And so keep the... Keep the Pate family in your prayers. Uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Y'all help me out. Todd Tucker. All right. Okay. So keep Todd Tucker and his family in your prayers. All right, who else? Yeah, Larry. No, he hadn't, but but he will in the next day or two, I hope, and they can go ahead. They're hoping to be able to, to do the uh, plastic surgery, get everything back in order up on his head. They, they did that, uh, taking out that melanoma on his head, and so they're hoping to, to fix that all back up Wednesday if they've got clean borders all the way around. So hopefully they will. Pray for Larry that it all go well. Yeah. Yeah, he's... <laughs> he can't be no uglier than them crawfish. <laughs> All right, good. Maybe he'll come. All right, who else? Yeah? Okay. All right. So keep Carmen in your prayer. She's at the emergency room now. So with her Condition, we'll be praying especially, all right? Appreciate it very much, all right? Who else? Alan McDaniel, yeah, keep Alan McDaniel in your prayers. Alan still having some problems, health problems, so Alan McDaniel, all right? Who else? Tim, let's remember Tim and in our prayers, all right? Who else? Anybody? Anybody? Wincy, you talked to Wincy? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe they can work that out. Wincy, keep Wincy in your prayers. All right? Anybody else? Gerald Brown, maybe keep them in your prayers. Cheryl, Cheryl's having a blazing this week, I believe it is, ain't it? Thursday, okay. So uh, keep her in your prayers. All right. Anybody else? Donna Christie. Continue to remember her in your prayers. Uh huh. Bubba Kelly. Bubba Kelly. We've been praying for Bubba for a long time, and he's just not doing well. So keep Bubba in your prayers. And of course, his wife, Terry. All right. Anybody else? Who? My mother-in-law. You better believe she needs some prayers. Uh huh? Oh, is that what it is? Oh, I thought you was about the meanness. Yeah. We got. <laughs> hey, Douglas. I might need some help up here, huh? No, he's shaking his head. I ain't getting no help out of here. <laughs> you're, on, you're on your own now. Yeah, she'll be going to the doctor this week with her back. She is having a lot of back problems, so keep mother-in-law in your prayers. Cause she does, she needs it, and so do we. Yeah, maybe you know what? I've I've heard that crawfish has something in it that really helps your back, and you, I, I have. So maybe if you can get her to eat them, go ahead. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, yes. We're glad you. Yeah. Amen. Amen, Joan. Glad you. I had my back to you there, and I didn't see you over there with the old man. But let's give Joan a hand. She's back with us this morning. Going with us. Again. 
Good deal. Thank God. All right. Anybody else? All right. Huh? The Moth family. That's right. The Moth family. Uh, anybody remember? Hayes Moth. Double Portion Baptist Church, Tuscaloosa. I used to ask old Hayes if he was still saved every time I saw him. All right. Anybody else? Everybody got it? Okay. And three, they always talk. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer then and we'll get underway. Lord, we just love you and thank you, God, for your wonderful, wonderful way that you take care of us. Father, I just pray thanking you for our church, for all that are here today, and we just ask you to be with us as we have our service this morning, as we dedicate ourselves to you. And Lord, in our, in our time of fellowship this afternoon, Father, we just ask you to get glory as we enjoy coming together and and be in your family and sharing our time with each other. I pray now that you'll receive our worship service in the name of Christ. Amen. One quick thing before we get started this morning. We have someone in our midst who has just graduated from high school. Trinity, would you please stand, darling? Are you, are you, are you shy or will you come forward? All right, come on up here, sweetheart. I don't like to embarrass anybody, but I want to get her up here where y'all can see. We love Trinity, and we thank her for, for being a part of our family. I'm not going to shake hands. We'll give you a hug. We're going to present you with this Bible, darling. That it'll be something that you'll have for all of your life, and that you'll be able to use it. Study about the Lord, okay? Love you. God bless you. Give her a hand. Oh, da yeah. Uh, David Thomas said, we oh, I'm David. <laughs> 64 this morning. That's great. You don't need to.
All right, thank you, choir and musicians. Good job. Way to go. Uh, April, Wednesday night. Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, choir. Okay, choir, 6 o'clock, Wednesday night. Going to go over some stuff. It'll be good, so y'all come on out and be with us. Next uh, weekend is Memorial Day. I understand that. This weekend is, is this message day today, at least, is memorial to our founding fathers. I'm not going to talk about our American founding fathers today. I'm going to talk about our spiritual founding fathers, our founding fathers of our faith, those who went before us. Many of them there are that we could list. Who wrote most of, the majority of, the New Testament? Does anybody remember who it was? That's right, it was Paul. Certainly it was. But who, who actually led Paul into the ministry? I know Jesus did on the road to Damascus, but I mean the human being who did it. Who? Was it Stephen? Let's look and see. Let's go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. What does Acts mean? Acts means to do or doing. All right? So these are the things that our founding fathers did as the church came into existence. Now, you don't think, I mean, there's going to be some teaching here as much as preaching, but I want you to get a handle on what has actually handed down to us what we have today. Who wrote the book of Acts? Well, Luke did. Now, who is Luke? Luke was one of the apostles, of course, but he was the one who was a doctor, a physician, all right? And he went with Paul everywhere he went, as far as we know, for a long, long time. Maybe it was to help Paul along because Paul had a whole lot of health problems. But Luke was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. He was a Gentile who lived in the Antioch area, which is in Syria. And Luke, after being an apostle, wrote the book of Acts. And as he wrote it, he wrote the account of Jesus uh, in, in the book of Luke. He wrote that according to the, the testimony, the actual words of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who told him all of the details, which, by the way, Luke, being a physician, was really, was really to give details. He he wanted everything down just exactly the way it was. And meticulously, he wrote the book of Acts as well as the book of Luke. The church was actually established after much, much, much persecution. Those who went before us, we have not a clue of what they went through to get us where we are today. You know, the, the biggest problem sometimes in our churches that we face is pastors who will sit and hold our head in our hands and moan and groan because Somebody was complaining that there wasn't any niner pudding at the last uh, fellowship, right? Well, we have a lot more problems than that, certainly, but that's one of the biggest. But uh, there was a man named Barnabas, a man named Barnabas, who went to Antioch, and what he was doing was Barnabas went over to Antioch to see there was a lot of Jewish people, uh, uh, Jewish Christians, who had fled over there to Antioch, and over Barnabas wanted to go over there and see them and minister to them and see what was going on. And there in that, in that congregation at Antioch, and by the way, Antioch is the, is the place where we were first called Christians there at Antioch, which means Christ-like. All right, so that, that's where the title of Christian actually came from. Paul, as uh, Barnabas went over there to Antioch, he came upon this group of people who had fled there to, to avoid the persecution that was going on toward Christians in that day, and guess who was there? There was Paul, who had been Saul of Tarsus, and he was there making tents. That was his trade. That's what he did for a living. Paul was a bivocational preacher, like many of us have been for all of these years. There he was, making tents. Now, this was after Paul's salvation experience, okay? So Paul had seen uh, Christ on the road to Damascus. He was already saved, but he was just doing whatever it was he was going to do until the Lord actually gave him a call to do more. He was there making tents. He was just doing his trade, trying to make a living. And so Barnabas brought Paul back out of Antioch and, and started, actually, those great mission trips that Paul went on. And so today we're going to kind of look at a little bit of that as the beginning of the church not only began to worship God after the after the ascension of Christ, but also began to grow and to get its roots established and to reach out into those around us. Old Luke was very intelligent. You could tell it by his writings, but he was very meticulous. 
He was very careful to get everything right and just right. And so by the inspiration of God, he wrote this, this wonderful book of Acts the way he wrote the story of Jesus according to Mary back in the book of Luke. He practiced medicine originally in, in the city of Philippi. It was there in Philippi that, that probably he, he brought Paul and, and established Paul to do the call of God that, that Paul had on his life. You know like I do, not only did Paul write the majority of the New Testament, but he also did the majority of the mission field work that started the church back in that day. In Acts chapter 16, if you want to look at that to begin with, in Acts chapter 16, verse 10, here's the details that Luke gave so that it would give you a good idea of the beginnings of the church and how the church really got started. Look there in Luke chapter 16, and we'll start reading in verse 6. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, and that's, that's kind of strange sounding, isn't it? They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to even start to preach there in Asia. God had a different plan. After they were come to Messiah, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. There again, don't stop here. Don't start anything here. Go on, i got other places for you to go. So they, passing by Messiah, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we, that means Luke, uh, Paul, uh, Barnabas, the whole crew, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, listen to how he words it, we came with a straight course to Samothracia and the next day to Neapolis. Now, when you look at those writings there, you see, here's the very, if you were to go back to the mouth of the Mississippi, there's a little spring on the side of a mountain that actually starts it. That's where he went for us to see the beginning of the church and how the church began to spring forward to become the mighty Mississippi that it is today, that is worldwide. As they went, and I want you to hear this and then we'll get into it. As they went, they began to try in the beginning to do like you and I do so much so often. They tried to do it their way. They said, well, okay, it's time to go. It's time to get started. And so I'm sure old Barnabas was, yeah, yeah, we got to get, get going. I don't know if it was Luke who literally cast the vision on Paul, whether it was Barnabas who did, whether it was someone else who did, but I do love the way there in verse 11 how he says, we, we set out, we began. This is an accurate account as it can get of the actual beginning of when the church started to reach out. The great writer of the gospel message of Paul, of Luke, of all the others who worked so hard to get us started, we see just a little diary of the beginning of the first church as the church was just getting started. Now let's back up to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 verse 1 is where we actually begin our story of the day. What has this all got to do with me? I want you to see the beginning there so that you can see where we are now, where you are. What are we doing today? We, we can look easily back and we will do so maybe. I don't know exactly what we'll do next Sunday but maybe we'll look more at the beginnings of America. But as we look at the beginnings of the church, I want us to see the roots. We can look back and see uh, through our family tree that we have so many people in our past that led up to who we are today. We can look back and say, wow, here's, here's grandma, great-grandma, great-great-grandma, and then if you go on back and get on the computer, you can find out a whole lot of things. But today, the founding fathers had a, had a beginning. They had a diary. They said, here's where it started. Here's where it started. Paul had been saved, but Paul had gone down to Antioch and just making tents till the time came when Barnabas said, on the call of God, we got to move. And so he carried him back with him, and the whole story began. Now, the book of Acts, Acts literally means doing things, doing something. These are the acts of the apostles. These are the things. Look at verse 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Theophilus means friend of God. So here's this friend of God that is, that is ready to go. He's ready to say, hey, we've, we've got to get started. Luke writes this and says, okay, Theophilus, we've made a contract. We've made treaties together. We've agreed together on things to begin. Here's the charter. This is the beginning. 
But look at how he begins it. And church, this is where you and I need to be today. We've got Vacation Bible School coming up. One of the most important events that we'll have all year long at this church. Many of you have already said, yeah, count me in. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to teach. Talk to some of the young people in our church here today who grew up through this church. They can give you page after page, chapter after chapter of memories that was made here at this church. What else happened? It put their roots in Christ and in this church. It gave them a beginning place. that gave them a, a foundation of faith. It was going to lead them into their adult life and even into the lives of their children. And so now as their turn begins and our turn continues, we look to them as they begin to lead our children into the future. Like arrows out of the quiver of a mighty warrior, our children will go into the future. Yes, you can say what you like, and I do too sometimes. I worry about our children's future. I think about, wow, I look at the babies, and I, and I adore them, and I love them. And you just want to take them in your hands and say, let me give you a great life. Let me take away all of the things that's going to be out there that's going to tempt you that's going to try to pull you into a, a hellish lifestyle, that's going to try their best to destroy your life. Not all of the children that grew up through our church are still here, but many of them are. That's the reason our church is still here. Were it not for those days, the, the works of those who came along first. And so as we look back at our beginnings, we look back and say, well, something has to happen. First of all, he said, they began to do what? To do and teach. The first thing is to do. The first thing is to begin. The first thing is to let your own life be the fountain that others can drink from to see what it is that Christ really means in the life of a person who's been saved, in the life of a person who's really committed themselves to the Lord. Let you first have the do. Be the doer. Be the one who lives your life in front of these kids and, and the younger, uh, younger generations that they will see they will see that I may be 70 years old, but I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. The word retirement does not appear in God's word. It does not appear there. There's no time to quit. There's no time to slack up until God says, I'm, bring them home. The word as God gave it to us is first, let's do. How important is it that we teach? Wonderfully important. Ain't Merle sits over here being... Uh, a few years older than me. <laughs> Y'all like that, didn't you? How many of these kids in this room today and those who are among us as still our regular church members can stand and hug her neck and say thank you for teaching us back in those days? Teaching is critically important. Davina and Melissa has been in the nursery for 50 years and they, they've taught, they've led, they've nursed on their knees. These children that have grown up through our church, how important is it that we commit ourselves today to do, do first. Live a life that is such that, that people don't, don't say, well, if that's a church member, I don't want to be one. Not a, not a life that people are going to say, well, I can't tell the difference between them and, and folks that don't go to church. Have a life that is a life of doing, a life that is lived doing for God. Teaching, yes, teaching comes second. But you can't teach me anything until I see your life and know what it's all about. Don't live a life of the devil and then come in here going to tell me about Christ. That don't work. Do and teach. And so the former treaties I've made to you, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Jesus is the beginner. Jesus did. Jesus lived that perfect life. We have that as our example. We, we shouldn't ever make excuses like this, but we know how human we are. But Jesus began to do action first. What you are is more important than what you try to teach. So let it be that your life, what I am, then we begin to teach. Then you step out into being a VBS leader. You step into being a Sunday school teacher. You step into being in the Sunday school class, helping boost that Sunday school teacher to higher levels. And then number two, until the day in which he was taken up. So Jesus, all the way up through everything till his, till his call of God on this earth, until his cross was completed, in that day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. What commandments did he give? So we're in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and following. Jesus gives a command to the church. We are to go ye therefore and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, he says, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. I think Jesus was looking at our age and saying, I'm still going to be with you, church. I'm still going to be with you. I'm still going to hold you up. I'm still going to provide for you. I'm still going to give you what you need to see you through. So he gave the commandments, uh, the apostles their commandments, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. That means after his cross, after his death, burial, and resurrection, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but listen to this, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom? Wilt thou restore the kingdom? He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, that means at home, and now all Judea, that is a rounding area, and in Samaria, which is a little further out, and then all the way under the uttermost parts of the earth. That's been accomplished, folks. Yes, there's missionaries all over this earth. There's mission, missionaries everywhere. America has been one of the greatest, or has been the, has been the greatest source of funding and of, and of warriors who've gone out into the field and gone all over the world making sure that this, that this message of Christ the good news, the gospel of Christ was preached in every nation on the earth. Jesus said, this has to happen before I can come again. It has happened. It's done right now. Anywhere on the face of this earth, you can turn on a computer and see messages about Christ. You can see missionaries in all parts of the world where they're being forbidden and they're being persecuted. They're still preaching that gospel. But first he starts, and that's why I say we begin at the beginning, but first he says, I want you to make sure what you're doing. He said, I want you to wait there at Jerusalem and see what happens. He says, I've got something that's coming. But be ready, be ready. It's coming, but just wait until the time is right. No drifting, no going back to your fishing boats. But he says, just get together in Jerusalem and hang on. Something wonderful is going to happen. And then he says, what is it? Baptizing what? And the Holy Ghost. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. What is baptismal? It means complete dunking. I mean, that means a complete submersion in something. If you're baptized into it, you're completely submerged in it. And that's what Jesus was saying. There's something that's coming. He had promised them over and over and over again, as long as he was here on this earth, that there's coming this comforter. There's coming this one who's going to be a go-between, between you and God. This thing that's going to come upon you, this, this person of God, which is the Holy Ghost, you're going to be baptized in it. You're going to be submerged in that. And so they were. As we know at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they were indeed submerged in the Holy Spirit. Now, many will tell you today that, that the evidence of that is speaking in the unknown tongue. Let me tell you something very carefully. Jesus never spoke in anything called the unknown tongue. People in the disciples' age spoke in other languages as God gave them utterance so that everyone in the congregation, everyone who was out there could hear and understand what they were saying. Now, one over here might not understand it, but that one over there did. If he had spoken in French or if he had spoken in Spanish, I wouldn't have been able to understand a word they said. But the Bible says the people of the congregation understood every word they said, even down to their lingo. But yet if you had, if you had just pulled a tape recording from back in those days, you would have thought it was gibberish. But to them, they understood every man in his own tongue. People from everywhere were there. People from every part of, of the area surrounding around, even throughout Asia, were there on that day. If they had just gotten up there and spoken Hebrew or Greek, then there would have been most people in that congregation would have understood a word they said. But they were not speaking in an unknown tongue. They were speaking in their own tongue, which is very well known to us all. And so understand that. When they begin to speak, they begin to speak so that all could understand. Then he goes on to say, listen, back to the book of Acts, no need to wonder, no need to worry, no need to get frustrated and upset while you're sitting there waiting to, well, twiddle your thumbs and think, well, if Christ never coming. No, when God got it all together, when the time came and it was ready, 
They moved, and when they moved, what a wonderful and powerful thing they did. In verse 6, he said, when they would come together, they asked him, they said, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? They were still thinking about an earthly kingdom. They were still, even after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, still thinking of an earthly kingdom that would make them the greatest in the world, that would make them the capital city of everything worldwide. Jesus said, no, now listen, it's not for you to know the times of the season. You can't know everything that has to be done that the Father has put in his own power. But your power, your power, your power is going to come from the United States of America government, right? Is that what he said? Your power is going to come from the Congress of the United States, right? <clears throat> the Treasury of the United States? No. Your power is going to come from the Holy Ghost who has come upon you, and then you'll be witnesses unto me. Then you'll go do my thing. Then you won't think about, worry about, put your time into things that are not important. They were amazed. They were amazed as the Holy Spirit came upon them there at Pentecost. They were amazed when this, when this thing, this power came upon them. They were rejuvenated. I am amazed today at where I am physically. Two years ago, a year ago, I couldn't do a third. I couldn't do a fourth of what I can now do this day. I am amazed when I can, with the power of God, go out and do the things that I do now that I used to do years ago. I am amazed to see what it feels like when the power is rejuvenated in you, when the power, the ability to move and to go begins to pick up again, the strength comes. That happened to them instantly. Not only did God give them the strength and the power physically, he gave them the wisdom and the knowledge mentally. He proved it by the speaking to the groups of people in tongues that they could understand. These guys were common guys. These were not guys who had been road scholars from some great university that had learned a half a dozen lessons and messages and, 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 and languages. They were just guys. And God now took it and gave it to them, just immersed them in it. And they could go out and, and, and do the things that God called them to do. Jesus said, and hear this, church, this is for you and me today. Jesus said, I'll see to it that whatever I call you to do, I'm going to give you the strength and the power and the ability and the means to do it. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? I would love to, to say to someone, look, whatever you need, you go out here. If God's calling you to preach, I'll take care of you. I can't do that. But God does that. God does that instantaneously. He gives you what you need. Oh, yeah, you grow as a preacher. I can go back and hear some of the messages that I preached years ago, and most of you wouldn't even be sitting here about five minutes after I got started. But today, God says, I'm going to work in you. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to grow you. I'm going to give you the experiences that you have, the times that you have with people, the things that happen to you along life's way. God says, I'm going to amaze you with what I can give you. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. Let me tell you something. Next to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the Holy Spirit is the greatest gift I've ever been given. The ability to just lean on God and know, I don't have to stand in and witness to someone alone because I'm never alone. The Holy Spirit is with me. The Holy Spirit, when I face temptation, is there with me. He will give me the power. He will give me the strength. He will give me the ability to do whatever it is that he's called me out to do. Now, you know yourself like I do. Not all of us are just alike. If I were to ask for volunteers this morning, I'd say, well, I tell you what, uh, let's see. Whose day is it to, to get up here and preach? How many of you would raise your hand and say, me, me, it's my turn? No. Same with Sunday school teachers. Same thing with deacons. Same thing with trustees, same thing with whatever might need to be done. We are all different. We all have our unique talents and unique abilities. Where did they come from? They came from God. It's because God gives us strengths in areas that we don't even know about until we step out and say, okay, God, I'm ready to do whatever you call me to do. All of us, all of us are plugged into God's power source. Now, whether or not we'll use it, that's up to us. Jesus' word to you is, go and witness. Start in Jerusalem. That means start at home. Start at your house. Start at this church. 
Start by teaching Sunday school. Start by teaching vacation Bible school. But start in your home. Dads, you're the first man. You're the first link. You're the first person that connects between the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and your family. It's up to you. If your family is ever going to hear the gospel message, then you're the first one that God's going to hold accountable to make sure that they do. You. And when you stand before God, it's going to be as simple as God looks you in the eye and you know exactly what he's thinking. Did you do for your family what I called you out to do? As men, we'll give an account. We'll give an account of whether or not we did and taught our families. These things we set out to do and teach. Do, Jesus said, first, so that your family will stand and say, my dad led us in the way of Christ. My dad lived a life that was a life of Christ. It was a life that was nothing more, nothing less than what Christ had told him and taught him to do. Our dad. Moms, you're next. You knew it was coming. You're next. You're next in that plan for God. Dad, don't do it. You got to. But first and foremost, you've got to hold him up. You've got to lift him up. You've got to empower him. You've got to support him to lead your family. Do what he Don't do or do what he can't do, but lift him up, lead him up. Kids, it's your responsibility to hear, to hear, to listen, to obey, to want to, to desire that that you would have the kind of life that God has for you to do. But all of us have the gifts, the calling to be witnesses for Christ. God gives us that power. There's a a U.S. Life Saving Service. They have a motto that says, we have to go out but we don't have to come back. How true is that? When we go into our Christian life, let's burn the boats. No going back to the boats. No going back to the beach and crying out and hollering for a boat. We're to go. Wherever he sends, we're to go. But it starts at home. It starts at our home church. It starts right here where we are. And you'll be amazed then at what God will do from there as he uses that teaching, that doing to send out to the far-flung areas of the world. Many of our founding fathers of the church were killed by the Romans. Many of them, many of them were burned to death at the stake. Many of them were just doused in, in kerosene or gasoline or something, and they were just set on fire to be torches for the king to read his book by. Listen, it's been a tough road. It's been a hard road for many before, and I'm sure they were not any different to us because they were fearful. Certainly they were. They were afraid of what was going to happen, the persecution that they were going to have to face. If you were going to come to church this morning, but you didn't know whether you could even get from your house to here without being captured and carried and put in prison. What if I had been afraid to stand in this pulpit this morning that some troopers might come through that door and, and knock it down and shut us down and take us away? Many of our founding fathers faced that. But they faced it without the paralyzing fear that stopped them. They were not stopped. They were not stopped. I've said this to you many times, but you know that you can easily measure your commitment to Christ. You can easily measure your commitment to God by looking at what it takes to stop you from serving him. And so sadly for many of us, it only takes a pillow. Oh, well, preach right here. Yeah, I'm serious. Oh, how good that pillow feels on Sunday morning. My goodness. Maybe it takes recreation. Maybe it takes something else to pull you away from church. That's one thing. But what does it take to stop you from serving Christ on a daily basis? And for too many of us, Satan does it with one simple little thing. It's called timidity. Being timid timid, being shy, or maybe it means just kind of a don't care attitude. Maybe it means that that maybe I didn't get up with that fire in my belly that I had yesterday or the day before. The preacher preached to a Sunday, and boy, he preached a great message about commitment, and Monday morning you wake up and you forgot every word he said. Apathy, apathy is one of the biggest stoppers of church people there is in the world. It's not that you don't care. It's just that you don't care 
as much for the work of the Lord as you do for other things that come into your life. Church, I know it's not easy sometimes to hear these things, but think about it. Think about it. Think about what does it take to stop you from serving God? What does it take to stop you from coming together and worshiping God? What does it take to stop your ministry for the Lord? When Augustine, <clears throat> he was the great leader of his day in Rome, he heard of the fall of Rome. When, when, when Augustine heard of the fall of Rome, he said these words. He was one of the very first of Christians. You are surprised that the world is losing its grip. Really? That the world has grown old and full of tribulations? Do not hold on to the old world. Do not refuse to regain your youth in Christ who says to you, the world is passing away. The world is losing its grip. The world is short of breath. Do not fear. Do not fear thy youth, for you shall be renewed as an eagle. Yes. <clears throat> I know the world's circumstances just as well as you do. The, the money at my house is just as tight as it is at yours. And I look at this government of ours and I think, dear God, what can we do? We can pray. We can commit our lives to Christ with a brand new commitment. And we can influence the world where we live. We can influence our children. We can influence our parents. We can influence our friends. We can influence those that are in our neighborhood. We can. We can make a difference where we are. And that's all God asks. Oh, wonderful if he were to call you into the, into the foreign mission field. Certainly, we'll support you and help you and get you there. But most of you are called by God right here in Jerusalem. Right here to make a commitment. Christ tells us, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. What do you do? You do and you teach. You do and you teach. You live the life and you teach according to your own testimony. Next and last, he's coming back. He's coming back soon and very soon. We're going to see the king. Soon and very soon, Christ is going to return. Or either he's going to take me to him. My life, most of it has been lived already. I know well and good that I have more, life, more years on this earth than I have left to stay on. But I can tell you this much that I know of a certainty. My commitment to Christ is to finish well. I don't know what your age is, and I don't know what God's calling you to do. But nobody, listen, nobody that has ever been saved by the blood of Christ has done so without being called by God to be a witness. Jesus said to the church, you are to be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world, he said, I have called you. Start where you are. Start with your family. Start with your friends. Start with the folks you work with. Oh, I'm not, I'm not telling you, don't go buy a big old cross about a foot high, and six inches wide. Or something. No, don't do that. Let your life be that testimony. Don't pound them and hound them with some all the time, but show them. Live among them the way Christ would. Let your conversation be according to conversation that is becoming of God and of Christ. Let them see, do. Let them see that you're doing. And once you do that, then you'll be able to teach them. Then they'll be willing to listen. As we have our invitation this morning, it's real simple. I don't know what your life is all about. I don't know what God has called you to do. don't know what God said to your heart this morning. I don't know what's in your mind right now as you've heard what I've just had to say. But let me tell you something for certain. This morning, if you do nothing else, will you please recommit yourself to the work that was started by our spiritual founding fathers, that was carried on by those of the generations before us, and let us be committed anew that we're going to make sure that that message, that gospel of Jesus Christ continues in me. 
do, I will do. Let's pray, God, I will do. God, I will do what you call me to do. I will do according to the precepts of God's holy word. I will do according to what the Bible tells me God loves, God wants. I will don't do the things that he don't want me to do. I want others to see Jesus in me. I will do. And I will teach, Lord, as you give me utterance to do so. Whether I'm a Bible school teacher, Sunday school teacher, or whether I'm just a witness, I will witness of the life you've given me and the joys that you've given, the provisions you've given to me. I will do my best and I will teach according to what I know to be the truth in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand this morning, I don't know what your need is.